Hello, I'm Jim Shields, your town moderator, and I would like to welcome you to this, the preview for our May 2014 annual town meeting. We've got 33 articles on the warrant for this meeting, and the voters are being, going to be asked to act upon an operating budget of about uh, $56 million, a capital budget of $1,150,000. There are some proposed zoning bylaw changes, including regulations uh, regarding uh, medical marijuana treatment facilities and dispensaries. There's a citizen's petition regarding uh, uh, focusing on a proposed amendment to our noise bylaw. Uh, and there's a number of other things that by which you, the voters, uh, act as the legislature for the town and enact the rules and regs that are going to be in place for the upcoming fiscal year. And I would like to urge each and all of you to attend and cast your vote. It's a privilege and a right that uh, we in New England have with Town Hall, where, as in East Long Meadow, with an open town meeting, any registered voter is uh, encouraged to come and, and vote on these important matters. Article 1, as it is every year, is basically a housekeeping article. It's an article by which the uh, various reports of the boards and committees and commissions are uh, entered into the record and accepted. Article 2 is the operating budget for the town being proposed by the Appropriations Committee, which this year is almost $56 million. Uh, Russ Denver, the chair of the committee, will explain how the budget was created and how it's going to be allocated and uh, maybe also the, the process by which the, the numbers were generated. So, Russ, please. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the Appropriations Committee uh, consists of seven members, a uh, good cross-section of the town. Uh, we actually meet uh, every Thursday for probably nine months out of the year. We are appointed by you, the moderator. Uh, and we start our budget process probably in September or October uh, for the next fiscal year, which would start the, pre or the next July 1st. We probably spend the first uh, six to eight weeks just developing a, a revenue estimate. So we look at where we might be for the next year with Proposition 2.5. We work with the assessors to determine what might be new growth in value, which we could uh, use for additional taxation. And we spend a great deal of time with a crystal ball trying to imagine what the increase or decrease in local aid, which consists of education funding and general funding, that we would get from the state. Once we have developed our big picture, we look at um, the trends in fixed costs that the town might have. So these are health insurance for uh, town employees and retirees, uh, utility cost, retirement system payments that we need to uh, meet every year. So these are the expenses that the town has very little control over. And then we spend a few meetings kind of generating a budget guideline that we give to departments and the boards and committees that oversee those departments. This past year on December 5th, we had a meeting with all the departments and their chairs and uh, chairs with the uh, boards and committees and we established a 1% growth guideline inclusive of salary increases for the departments. We felt that with the increase in the fixed cost that we have very little control over uh, that the 1% parameter that we gave the departments would fit within the revenue projection that we have. And as we sit here today at May 5th, 2014, that revenue estimate is pretty much right on target. There's been very little movement. We primarily use our local aid numbers based upon what uh, the governor submits for a budget uh, in January. And so far that number is pretty much held. We uh, then don't meet for about a month or so while the departments and their boards and committees are developing their budgets. Um, it has been a difficult year for some departments to uh, stay within that 1% guideline. Uh, there will be some personnel uh, cuts in a number of departments. There will be things re relating to uh, departments not opening uh, or being, being open full time uh, because they weren't able to fix or if they weren't able to put those hours within their 1% equation. Training, uh, non-mandated training for the police department will uh, be impacted by this. And the uh, Blackboard Connect on the town side 
which informs residents about when tax bills are due and water bills are due and uh, you know town meetings coming up when town elections are coming up as of right now uh, effective July 1st that will go away because there's not going to be sufficient funding for that um, in January we begin meeting with all the town departments uh, and their boards and committees this year we required uh, that prior to meeting with the Appropriations Committee that those departments uh, at least have an oral approval about the budget that they've submitted from that board or committee and a member from that board or committee also attend the budget meeting with the Appropriations Committee. I think that has smoothened out the process. Um, there's much more give and take with the elected you know, representatives from the boards that might oversee those departments. And um, I'm very happy to say that we are within that 1% for the departments. And I, I just want to tell people the budget will increase about $1.5 million. About $400,000 of that represents the 1% increase that we asked for the departments. The other remaining money involves uh, expenditure capital. I think that Eric Madison from the Capital Planning Committee discuss how we'll be spending those dollars. There is a snow and ice deficit from this past winter that we have to account for. Uh, I think we're going to be taking another $200,000 or so from snow and ice. Uh, other additions are the total amount of health insurance cost will go up $150,000. Uh, that number might have gone up $250,000 if not for uh, the entity that provides the health insurance for retirees and employees had not voted to maintain a, uh, the same rate for premiums. Uh, so we're, we're happy to, quote, save $100,000 on that. Uh, but we have also are adding $50,000 to the stabilization count, which is probably the closest thing to a rainy day fund that the town has. Uh, and as you know, requires special uh, vote at town meeting to be able to release the money from there. We're also adding $50,000 to an account called a pension uh, trust fund for the town, and that is to pay for future retiree health insurance costs for uh, town employees that retire. They're able to then access by state law health insurance until the day they die. So we need to be able to start putting money away uh, to pay those future costs. So between uh, about $500,000 with capital uh, projects, uh, the snow and ice deficit, some miscellaneous accounts, and the 1% increase, that gets us to about $1.5 million increase for next year. The uh, funds that you're talking about the, to fund the future retirement and so forth, uh, that's what they call OPEB? Is that, yeah. Am I correct on that? Yeah, it's called the Other Post-Employment Benefits. Um, it is a right now an un. Uh, it's a request by the state um, that requires every municipality to do an assessment of about what their unfunded liabilities will be at this point in time. Uh, the last report that came out for East Long Meadow, I think about three or four months ago, had East Long Meadow's unfunded liability at $17 million. Uh, that's up $11 million from the last two years, so that's a dramatic increase. And so quickly, the way it works, if you have a town employee who gets hired at age 35, let's say they work 20 years uh, with the town, they retire at age 55, then until the day they die, they have the ability to access uh, health insurance through the town's plan. Right now, the town pays 70%. Uh, they contribute 70% of the premium for uh, for anyone prior to reaching or being eligible for Medicare at age 65, and then it's 50%. So that example of the employee who gets hired at 35, works 20 years, uh, retires at age 55, if that individual then lives to the age 75, that's an additional $130,000 obligation for that one individual just for the health insurance. Now, if that individual is then survived by a spouse, that spouse continues to be able to access that health insurance as well. These are state costs that as of right now, the town does not have any control over. 
Um, but it's responsible for. But the town is responsible for that for that payment. And we're all, you know, many of us are baby boomers, and there are more people retiring than we're bringing on for staff. So um, those out, that financial obligation will continue for an extended period of time. And those are funds that the town will have to provide, and it will most likely have an impact on services uh, for the rest of the town because we're going to have to put more money into that and then there might be less money for overall services as a result. And the number you gave, the $17 million figure, that's, that's amounts that, we, that are estimated or actuarially uh, estimated to be owed even if we stop the program today. Correct. That's just an unfunded li liability as of right now. So it's a, it's a big expense. So the Appropriations Committee realized that I, I, we'd like to almost try to discipline um, the budget process so that each year we realize that we need to put some monies into that OPEB pension trust fund. Um, we know that $50,000 might not have a great impact uh, on that overall liability, but if we can do 50,000 this year, 75,000 next year, 100,000, uh, and start moving the needle on that. So we realize that down the road, the state will eventually require every municipality to actually come up with a funding plan. And if we're a couple hundred thousand dollars ahead of the game, we're gonna be better off than many other communities. And finally, uh, I know one of the projects that the committee has uh, championed over the past several years has been uh, a decrease each year in reliance on so-called free cash to fund our operating budget. And I believe you successfully this year, we're not using any free cash for that purpose. Well, there's a difference between um, operating budget and then capital projects. Um, and about five years ago, this town was using uh, a million dollars to fund the operating budget uh, of the town each year. And the operating budget would be things like salaries, uh, utility cost, you know, buying paper products and you know, computers and so forth. And um, we came quickly to the realization that that cannot continue. And I guess I want the people who are watching this to know that free cash is, is pretty much if you used your own uh, personal uh, life experience, if you took home $1,500 a week and you uh, had a uh, household budget of $1,200 a week, that $300 left over uh, at the end of the week would be considered free cash. Well, for a municipality, we raise revenue, we have expenditures. And if at the end of the year, there's more money available because we've either raised more money than anticipated or spent less money than anticipated, that is free cash. And it gets rolled over to the free cash account. And then at town meeting, town meeting can appropriate that money for uh, operating expense or for capital. So the Appropriations Committee said, we are going to reduce the use of free cash $250,000 a year for operating expenses over a four-year period. And you're absolutely correct. So this year, we have not put money, uh, we have not put free cash into the revenue for appropriations for operating expense for fiscal year 15. We are using it to buy um, uh, you know, capital projects. We are using it to fund the snow and ice deficit. In Massachusetts, they allow you, if you get a deficit over the course of this fiscal year, which ran from July 1st of 2014 through June, excuse me, July 1st of 2013 through June 30th of 2014, I mean, we had a tough winter. So there's a deficit of about 370 or $380,000. So there's two ways we could have taken care of that. We could have rolled that deficit into next fiscal year, or we could take it and pay it off this year with free cash. We said um, we're gonna use free cash to pay that off in this fiscal year so that we don't need to raise and appropriate the additional amount of money next year and then impact other departments as a result of that. Great. So. Well, I know the committee has put in uh, many hours of effort and, and with the cooperation of the 
various other boards and committees, and uh, uh, we look forward to a spirited discussion of the, of the budget at the town meeting floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you might expect, the single largest component of the town's operating budget is dedicated to education. And here to explain the school budget component of the operating budget are Gordon Smith, our superintendent of schools, Terry Olajars, the assistant superintendent for business affairs, and Deidre Mayu, who is the chair of the school committee. Thank you very much for joining us. And Thank you for the opportunity to be here and go over, present an overview of our budget. So your budget is $27,400,000 and change. So that's an awful lot of money. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so uh, the fiscal year uh, 2014, the one we're in, it's $27 million. Um, was it 146, 146, 500, and then going into the next fiscal year, what we're projecting will be 27 million four hundred seventeen thousand nine hundred sixty-five dollars, which is the one percent increase the that 1 increase. Russ had mentioned. Right. Sure. Well, which was I was going to start off with that back in December, <laughs> appropriations set a parameter of a one percent increase for the school budget, and so the past few months, we as a school committee had worked with the leadership team and also continuing to work with appropriations to come up with a final budget. Um, it was quite a challenge for us. However, we always tried to, in the back of our mind, really try to keep it where we had the least impact on the students. And what we're going to do is Terry Olojars is going to go into a little bit more detail about the numbers, and then Gordon Smith is going to continue with talking about the impact on the schools and a little bit more about that 1% increase. Terrific. So the first step in the budget development guideline was to identify a level services budget. A level service budget means that all programs, staffing, and services are carried forward from this fiscal year into the FY15 budget. A level services budget was established at a 2.6% increase, which equals $717,580. Since this year's budget is $27,146,500, a 1% budget is equal to only $271,465. So although our budget will be increasing by 1%, it really means a reduction of $446,115. So that was actually our challenge basically from January. I think uh, Russ Denver talked about how all the departments uh, submitted a preliminary budget back in January. And um, at that time, we outlined both the level services budget that Ms. Olajar has just spoke about, as well as what a 1% increase would look like. And we were looking at reducing to meet that 1% increase about $446,115, which is uh, a sizable sum of money. Uh, when you look at a department that's 83 percent, uh, basically 83 percent salary in its budget, it's challenging to reduce by that amount of money without eventually impacting programs and personnel. However, in all of our discussions and um, planning sessions from January right up really until the um, budget hearing just uh, last week, we had an overarching focus on all those discussions and planning um, meetings around where are the reductions that will have the least impact on the core instruction that touches all of our students on a daily basis in the classrooms across the district. So with that said, we looked first to where can we reduce things that aren't impacting that core instruction. So you would look to things like supply. Um, I think earlier one of the presenters was talking about uh, paper goods. All departments um, have supply around paper for their copiers. Um, it might be paper goods found in cafeterias, that kind of thing. Is there any reduction there? Um, and there were a certain amount that we could reduce as we looked at that, but um, certainly it wasn't enough to get to $446,000. We did, as we continued to have these discussions, and all the discussions were beneficial because as we looked at the budget, we kept looking at, oh, are there different ways we can look to impact students in a positive way and maybe be more efficient in how we're spending our money. As we got to early March, uh, the collaborative, the educational collaborative we belong to, the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative, was asked by the state, actually it was a little bit stronger than just being asked, they were <laughs> mandated by the state to um, 
re-establish how they assess their seven member districts, and East Long Meadow is one of those member districts. So with that reassessment, we, for the next fiscal year, actually benefit quite a bit. So we are saving a considerable amount of money for the next fiscal year with our assessment for the programs we utilize for our students through the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative. We also are going to be able to use for next year a one-time credit of approximately $68,000, um, which we can put towards the collaborative payment or assessment for next year, and then that's gone. Um, and we will have a savings in our special education transportation assessment next year. We're, we're using fewer of their um, buses for transportation and um, sending out fewer students to out-of-district placements at the moment. Um, those are all things that are subject to change, but in this moment in time as we plan for next year's budget, those are reductions that we can incorporate going forward. Unfortunately, it's not enough to, it got us a good distance towards that 446,000, but it's, it's not enough to just stay there, and we did have to look at um, programs and positions. So there, there were um, some reductions that we had to make, and we talked about this at the town budget hearing last week, and um, certainly want to make sure that people understand the different uh, reductions that were made. So we will reduce by one elementary teaching position. We will reduce um, by one gifted and talented position at our middle school. We will reduce by two paraprofessional positions, and we will reduce for the next fiscal year by 1.5 FTE custodial position, and that will happen somewhere in the November time frame. So it actually in the future fiscal year will become a 1.0 reduction. Um, those, none of those reductions were reductions that um, school committee, East Long Meadow Public School leadership team, and for that matter appropriations um, wanted to make, but they were reductions that, um, as we looked across the district and said, again, how do we meet this challenge of reducing by $446,115 $446, and impact the fewest students as we go forward? These are really thought out reductions where, say, the elementary position will be at the third grade level where our enrollment is lower than at some of the other grade levels. Um, we have kept our gifted and talented program intact pretty much kindergarten through grade five where we both have a push-in program that where it's connecting with every student in that school building and at the fourth and fifth grade level a pull-out program. And we hope to be able to do some things with gifted and talented as we go forward on the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade level, but that's in the planning stage at the moment. So there were um, some really impactful reductions that were made, and um, we were very thankful that in March we got the good news, uh, not so much for the Lower Pioneer Valley Educational Collaborative, it wasn't great news for them, but from our standpoint going forward, the assessments for the next fiscal year will be farther reduced than we originally thought. But I guess just looking to the future, is that benefit sort of a one-off so that two or three years down the road it'll be built into the structure so the decision-making is not going to get any easier? No, <laughs> it's not. You're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, if you think just of how the now the LPBC will assess us, it's going to be sort of a rolling type of assessment. So your usage could go up during a given school year, and so that's much more challenging to plan for. Um, with that in place this year, we didn't have to go further into programs in person. Mm -hmm. So if we do have more challenging fiscal years next year, year after that, uh, decisions will become uh, a tougher. challenging and, uh, and very serious. And um, all of the discussions have been very serious and mm -hmm. I think very uh, responsible mm -hmm. and fiscally responsible for the town. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, down the road mm -hmm. discussions mm -hmm. won't be uh, even more critical. And I know one, uh, one expense that uh, many people have questions about or don't maybe fully understand uh, are those related to special education, mm -hmm. where with most of what you budget for, 
you have a pretty good ability to guesstimate what the expenses are going to be, whereas, as I understand it, and I'm certainly no expert, the special ed budget or component of your budget can be thrown completely out of whack if somebody moves into town uh, right. and, and has a child that requires some special education. Sure. And the state does not fully reimburse the town, as I understand that, for oh, those expenses. Right. No, they, they do not. You actually have to um, even to begin to look for any kind of state reimbursement, go four times the average per pupil expenditure mm -hmm. before you start to qualify for um, getting reimbursement that would come at the end of that fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of retroactive, if you will. Well, thank you very much for the efforts you've put in. It's, uh, it, it's a very challenging and difficult decisions mm -hmm. that have to be made, and those decisions obviously are in good hands. So thank, thank you very you. much. Great. Thank you. Thank you again. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have a capital budget being proposed this year of $1,150,000. Here to explain how that budget was created and what it is going to be used for if approved is Eric Madison, the chair of our Capital Planning Committee. Welcome, Eric. Jim, thank you. This year's Capital Plan uh, started in the fall where departments submitted various projects to the Capital Planning Committee for consideration. The committee uh, is comprised of myself, Connie Wisbicki, Steve Loyak, Rocco Carabetta, Ryan Quibby, Tom O'Connor, and of course, our town accountant, Tom Caliento, is an ex-officio member. Each of the, um, well, 33 projects were submitted this year, totaling $5,628,000 in requests. The committee, when evaluating each of these, uh, operates from certain objectives in that we evaluate each project based upon a pre-established criteria that we utilize. We prioritize all the projects submitted based upon an outcome of that evaluation with the highest priority assigned to number one. Assign projects to the funding sources. And throughout the, the whole process, we work with the Appropriations Committee as well as other departments in establishing an appropriate budget for this year's capital projects. By starting this process early, it allows us to develop the project list long before a budget is actually developed. That way the, the projects can then be just plugged into the budget as it develops. So through the review process, we break each one into a specific category. The categories are public safety, which is <clears throat> basically maintaining or improving the public safety or the department's ability to operate safely. A government mandate which is a new mandate required by state or federal government to maintain or to carry on a service. Capital infrastructure maintenance, which is really just the maintenance of our systems, our buildings, and all the assets in town. Improved operations, and these are projects that are submitted that will improve existing operations or services currently being delivered to the community. Energy efficiency is another category, which stands for, obviously, improved energy efficiency, with, uh, ultimately with the cost savings to the town. Then there's quality of life, and these are projects that improve or maintain the quality of life and enhance our community. Uh, examples of this are the athletic fields and the uh, sidewalks and things along that line. And finally, new operations. These are projects that are submitted that represent a new or a newly introduced operation to the town. The typical funding sources that we have to work with are the general fund, which is general is funds raised from taxation, including the use of free cash. The water fund, which is revenue generated when residents pay their water bills. The sewer fund, which is revenue generated when residents pay their sewer bills. Any remaining money from closed capital projects, when, when projects are bonded um, and all the money bonded was not utilized to complete that project, the remaining money must be used in a similar type project in a similar fashion. And then finally, there's special accounts, and those are accounts that are, are uh, revenue that's raised for specific purposes and used only to support that purpose. An example of that would be the LCAP revolving fund. So what are FY15's recommended projects? The projects that made it through the cut this year and are being recommended for funding are 
the replacement of the dry vit exterior system at Birchen Park School for $217,900. That is the exterior finish on the side of the building, which is cracking and peeling and falling off in some areas. Full replacement of the chiller system at Birchland Park Schools. And some folks might remember that last year we appropriated uh, some money toward the, the repairs of that system. Uh, when those repairs were started, um, it became uh, very obvious that it, the, the unit, the chiller system, really was not uh, repairable and has to be uh, replaced. So this $38,700 will be utilized with the money appropriated last year to replacement of the chiller system at Birchman Park School. Um, technology maintenance in the schools in the towns, $375,000. This is um, computers, servers, uh, thin clients, tablets, printers, uh, cameras, security cameras, radios, and telephones throughout the entire town. This is part of a routine and regular maintenance for the replacement of uh, older and worn out uh, technology in town. A new air handler system for the town hall, $30,000. A new fire alarm system at the police station, $25,000. Two new police cruisers for $77,000 for the two of them. Sidewalk construction fund, $75,000. And this is a fund that we try to contribute to annually um, that helps build and maintain and replace sidewalks throughout the town. Replacement of water mains on Millbrook Drive and Hunting Road, $261,000. An inflow and infiltration work, which is uh, an examination and repairs to our sewer system to make sure that we're only paying for waste that we put into the system and not groundwater for $50,000. The total recommended um, budget for uh, FY 2015 is uh, $1,150,379 uh, broken down as follows. General fund projects raise and appropriate $500,000. By that I mean $500,000 will be voted at the town meeting that comes out of your property taxes uh, toward paying for these capital projects. Free cash, $339,129 for a total general fund of $839,129. Under the water fund unreserved account, in the water unreserved account is um, money in excess of what was needed to uh, in previous fiscal years that goes into an unreserved count, much like the free cash does in the general fund. $261,250. In the sewer unreserved account, $50,000. Again, for a total of $1,150,379. We also each year submit um, a five-year plan, and although the five-year plan is not fully vetted and each project has not been examined and is certainly not being recommended at this time, um, we do report to the voters um, the, the requests that come in. In 20, year 2016, $3.4 million in requests. In 2017, $5.1 million. In 2018, $5.1 million. And looking as far out as 2019, $1.7 million. What this does represent, though, is that the needs in town for, uh, for capital funding uh, over the longer term and uh, for the maintenance of our infrastructure, buildings, and systems in town. So there's no uh, bonding or borrowing contemplated this year with any of the capital projects? No, there, there's uh, no bonding or borrowing um, being recommended. Uh, in fact, the Capital Planning Committee and the Appropriations Committee together took a stance a few years ago to pay down some of our existing debt before we incurred any new, new debt. Um, and we've, uh, we've been able to accomplish that and still maintain our system over the last uh, several years. So we're committee is looking for and recommending slightly more than a million one for this year, but for future years, that number seems to grow significantly year after year. So we have, do have some, some uh, interesting challenges ahead. 
We do. We have um, actually there's there's uh, capital needs that are not represented in those numbers either. Uh, an example of that would be if we uh, plan to build any new school buildings or renovate any of the existing school buildings. Um, there's been uh, a lot of talk about the uh, the town hall and the limited space in town hall and uh, whether renovations or the purchase of a different building. Um, along with that, the uh, fire department has uh, informed us and, and requested that we start planning for the replacement of its ladder truck, uh, which is about a million dollar project. So there are some very sizable projects in the future that um, is going to require some long term financial planning. Well, thank you very much and thanks to your committee as well for the efforts you've put in. Thanks for having me. Well, as Russ Denver said, there are uh, a number of financially related articles on the warrant, and he specifically referred to two in addition to the one relating to the budget, and those have to do with both the stabilization fund and then the fund that uh, is referred to sometimes as OPEB, the uh, benefits uh, type of uh, funding issues. And uh, as is customary, the Board of Selectmen have a number of articles on the warrant, and the articles three and, uh, four and five uh, relate to those two articles. And here to explain uh, what those articles are intended to do is Paul Federici, a member of the Board of Selectmen. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, article 4 regarding the Stabilization Fund is, is an article where we are intending to put $50,000 into the Stabilization Fund. Now, the Stabilization Fund is part of our town's what we call free cash. And the town has to have a certain amount of free cash in order to um, establish a good bond rating for our, for our lending. Uh, right now we have a AAA bond rating, which is which is very good. It's actually gone up in the last year, and that's due to the hard work and dedication of our town accountant and the appropriations committee and all the boards involved to, uh, you know, try to keep costs down. Um, so what we're trying to do once again is the, the appropriations has deemed that they'd like to, on an annual basis, keep start or keep funding the stabilization fund to keep our our free cash over five percent. So therefore, we can continue to keep our good bond rating. Um, Article 5 has to do with the, uh, as, as the moderator said, OPEB, which is the Pension Reserve Fund. Um, every town in the state, in the Commonwealth, is severely underfunded in their, in their amount that is going to be due for pension obligations to retirees. This is our effort to begin to fund this, this shortfall, and hopefully um, over the years we can continue to fund it. Um, and eventually get to where we have it fully funded and we don't have to worry about the cost for the pensions. Thank you. Just to clarify one piece of the, uh, of the stabilization fund. Stabilization is actually somewhat segregated from and separate from free cash uh, because uh, funds that go into and come out of the stabilization fund require a two-thirds vote at a town meeting. It's, it's really considered um, uh, there for long-term issues uh, uh, it's a reserve that uh, requires specific and, and special action, more than a majority, uh, to access and to fund. Uh, so that will be a two-thirds vote for, uh, for Article 4. Article 6, which is sponsored by the Board of Selectmen, has to do with uses of funds that are unexpended during this fiscal year, although they had been budgeted for, for other purposes where there might have been a shortfall. And here to explain that article is Angela Thorpe, our new chair of the Board of Selectmen. And congratulations on your appointment to that position. Thank you so much. Um, this article will be a transfer to cover um, a snow and ice deficit, as well as covering some of our health um, benefits def deficit that we have experienced. Um, on the day of the, the town hall meeting, we will explain exactly what um, account has the surplus and where the, mount, the money will be transferred for the deficit. Okay, there'll be specific account numbers attached to the, Ex the source and the use. Exactly, okay. yes. And then Article 7, which is a housekeeping measure having to do with prior year bills, bills that came in after the fiscal year mm -hmm. for which they were incurred uh, and which now need to be paid. Uh, and so can you, yeah. is a $5,000 number or some such number attached to that? It's a $5,000 number. Um, what happens is sometimes we have people that don't send in their invoices in a timely fashion, and it's after the July 1st deadline. So what happens is we need to go ahead and pay those people, and so it needs to be encumbered in Article, Article 7. 
Okay. Um, I am pleased to announce at this point in time, we don't have any. And oh, so um, we <laughs> might not need that, um, but we'll know on the day of our town meeting. Very good. And if there are none, we will remove the article. Okay, thank you. Article 8 is sponsored by the Board of Public Works and it has to do with highway funds and here to highway funds that the town can get from the state. And here to explain how that works is a member of the Board of Public Works, John Mabry. John. Thank you. So uh, that article is to vote and raise the appropriate by borrowing or otherwise, inappropriate by borrowing or otherwise, the $669,015, which was given to us by the, um, the state. 581,752 of that was the regular Chapter 90, and we got this year an $87,263 pothole funding. So it's pretty standard Chapter 90 article. Um, the pothole funding is gonna be put forward so we can do like Pease Road, Chestnut Street, Meadowbrooks uh, Road, um, which you know need to be done based on the winter. Um, and it's allowing us to take more focus of our Chapter 90 funds and we'll use those with a combination of FY13 and 14 funds, and we are finally going to reconstruct Elm Street uh, to produce a longer lasting, more comprehensive you know, fix to the street. So we were hoping that the state was gonna give us some money to make that happen. That didn't happen, so instead we're gonna take it on. And instead of just doing a selective overlay, we are actually gonna do a full reconstruction by reclaiming, rototilling uh, the existing pavement into the gravel and improve it, placing a couple layers of pavement. So, That'll be a real good um, uh, benefit to the taxpayers, and Elm Street is well overdue. In, in addition to that, we'll be doing some uh, funding of things like crack sealing and microsurfacing of some of the other roads in town. So we're in pretty good shape to get us back in better shape with our roads this year with the use of that chapter. After a tough winter. Yeah, it was really tough. So uh, if I understand correctly, the 669000 and change is essentially money that the state is giving to us, but we need to vote to accept it. And, exactly. And utilize it. Yep, and cool. pretty much do it every year. The funding was pretty similar to last year, but then the pothole gave us a little boost, so we're in good shape there. Very good. Thank you very much. Articles 9 and 10 have to do, they're related to each other. They have to do with the establishment of uh, water and sewer enterprise funds, which is something that uh, our town's auditor has recommended uh, be done uh, in the past, and we are attempting to do it at this town meeting. And again, to explain the, uh, how those articles are intended to work is Paul Federici from the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, once again, these two funds are, we go hand in hand. One is obviously for the water, water department, one is for the sewer portion of the uh, Department of Public Works. And they are intended to um, set up a fund so that the monies that are taken in for the water and sewer fees are allowed to be used for expenses relating to those fees, uh, be it well, really any expenses relating to the um, Department of Public Works and the handling of, of our water and sewer functions in town, as opposed to the money going into the general fund where it could be used for any purpose and they might, and in that case, the, the uh, DPW may not have the ability to use those funds for their necessary, the necessary uses that they have. Uh, this, this item is a, is a state, uh, it's under the Mass General Laws and it has been something, as the moderator said, that for the past five or six years, our, um, our auditors, um, Scanlon Associates, have recommended, uh, and every year they recommended it a little more strongly. So, so this year we got together with the DPW and uh, we hammered out some, some negotiations, if you will, and everyone was in agreement that we should do this. And actually, if I may say, the DPW has been very, uh, very forthcoming in uh, allowing the town to actually, through the, or will be allowing the town, through the use of these water and sewer funds, to sort of recoup some of the expenses that are being paid for through the general fund that are actually expenses of the Department of Public Works. And as, uh, as Paul said, uh, the Board of Public Works has supported this, will be speaking in favor of this at the uh, annual town meeting. And in addition, uh, I know that uh, they hope to have uh, Mr. Scanlon from uh, Scanlon Associates, the town's auditor, to also attend the town meeting uh, because some of the aspects of this might be uh, more technical than uh, we customarily may need to deal with, so Mr. Scanlon will be available to answer any questions that uh, you, the citizens, may have. Articles 11 through 16 each relate to a separate revolving fund uh, for a particular count. State law allows uh, a community like ours to establish revolving funds where the 
uh, agency or the board or the department has a program or a, uh, a use that actually generates revenue. And this allows that revenue to be uh, utilized within that department instead of automatically going back to uh, the general fund for the town. And to explain most of them, I'm going to take on one of them, to explain all the rest is Angela Thorpe. And Angie, beginning with Article 11, that mm -hmm. has to do with uh, the cable access, which is what we're using right now. So right, right. Can you explain that for well, us? Well, there is a cap on it of $132,000. And uh, as you said, they are established so that the departments can take the money out. We don't put money into the cable account. That comes from our cable uh, users. And um, that's generously donated from the cable company to us. Um, from those um, invoices. Okay, and then Article 12 has to do with Center School Park. Okay, that was set up so that uh, any grants or any donations that they receive, it would go in directly into that fund. Um, it's been pretty stable um, uh, these past two years. It hasn't had any activity, but it's better to have it, not need it, than to need it, not have it. Okay, and then Article 13 is solid waste disposal. Um, that is used for um, the revenue from when we uh, sell the bags and um, for the leaves for the, for the town, and then we go ahead and we purchase from that account as well. To the uh, resupply. The for the resupply mm -hmm. of the recycling. Mm -hmm. um, it also um, supplies our recycling bins that, that our townspeople are using, and I would encourage them to also go to town hall and pick those up when they have a need. Okay. Article 14 is Council on Aging. Council on Aging, uh, they, as you know, they receive quite a few grants, and so the money is funneled through there, and they take care of their, their bills that come in um, that are directly associated with Council on Aging. Okay. And Article 15 has to do with the Library Revolving Fund, and Susan Peterson, the director, asked that I briefly explain that, and this is, uh, I believe, the exact same um, motion or article warrant uh, a warrant article, excuse me, of, as last year where $15,000 is sought and that is generated primarily through fines for overdue books and the like. Oh. Article 16 has to do with the Recreation Department. Now Article 16 is a little bit different. There is not an amount uh, attached to it. They generate their funds from um, the activities that are offered to uh, um, the entire East Long Meadow community. Um, mostly we have a large um, population that are, that are involved in sports and so their funds go in there and they use it to purchase um, balls, equipment. Uh, it is not used for any employee salaries and the way that the statute is set up, the statute is set up so that no employee funds can be um, taken away from this revolving fund. So it's basically so, for the supplies used in the various sports. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Article 17 uh, speaks to the funding for the annual 4th of July parade, and Paul Federici from the Board of Selectmen will be talking about that article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, article 17 has to do with the annual funding of our town parade. In the past, I believe it was a couple of years ago, and previous, um, this item was just a line item on our general budget for the town. But what we felt back then as, as our board, the Board of Selectmen, was that it would be nice to sort of segregate it and for transparency purposes and let the town know exactly what, what we are spending on an annual basis for the parade. And as everyone knows, anyone who's been in town for any significant length of time, the parade is a uh, one of the jewels in the, in the crown of the town of East Longmeadow. It's extremely popular. It's one of the largest parades, I believe, in the state, if not the largest on the 4th of July. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful event and there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And uh, obviously every year the town is, is, or at least the board, is more than happy to uh, offer, up, um, offer up financing to help um, with this process. And, and to let you know, our financing uh, is not the total amount that the, uh, that the parade needs to, to fund itself. It has other sources of income, and uh, I believe it's a total cost of somewhere around $26,000 to put the parade on, if I've got that figure right. So the town, town contributes a portion of that, but... Uh, but certainly not the total amount. And uh, again, to clarify, uh, the 
we changed the method by which, or the timing of the funding for the parade uh, a couple of town meetings ago. Uh, the funding for the parade on July 4th of 2014 was approved last year. Uh, so the funding that's being requested at this town meeting will be for the parade on July 4th, 2015. Article 18 deals with funds uh, generated for the town's use uh, by virtue of the Community Preservation Act. And here to explain Article 18 and how it works and perhaps how the, how the funding occurs is the chair of the Community Preservation Committee, George Kingston. George. Thank you. Uh, the community preservation funds come from two sources. They come from a 1% surcharge on the property taxes in town that is matched to a certain percentage by the state. That percentage varies from year to year depending on state revenues. Uh, this year we don't know exactly what the match is going to be because we don't know what the state, uh, the state collection for um, community preservation, which is, comes out of, uh, of fees that are assessed when uh, property is sold, uh, and also from additional funds that are appropriated by the legislature. However, Article 18 simply puts us in line with the state law that requires that 10% of m money coming in be committed to historical preservation, 10% for community housing, and 10% for open space. In addition, we add a 5% um, amount for administration. Everything else goes into an undesignated fund. At this town meeting, we will not be asking for the expenditure of any community preservation funds because we have not seen any appropriate projects come through since the last town meeting. And we are trying to build up our reserves um, after having spent a fair amount of money for the pool. We're hoping that we'll have some new projects next year that are worthy of spending money on. And at that point, we will be coming back to you with those projects. Thank you. The warrant that you will be receiving has an Article 19 which uh, John Maybury from the Board of Public Works will explain, but he will also explain why there will not be any action uh, asked to be undertaken on that article when we come to the town meeting floor on May 19th. John. Uh, thank you. So I think most people were aware last uh, year at a town meeting we were looking into the possibility of uh, another building uh, to actually move some of the town hall into. So that pretty much went on during the year. Um, and most recently that has, um, not made it to this town meeting, so that article to go to a new building is not there. In, in the very late hours, we were working on seeing if we could do some modifications to the town hall, uh, and at first we were gonna submit an article for somewhere between 200 and 400,000 to kind of move the accounting office, move the selectmen and IT space around and try and get a better working condition uh, that was needed at the town hall. Uh, we pulled that down to 30,000 to just do some electrical switch gear which is needed and subsequently had a couple more meetings. So this town meeting, we aren't putting anything through. So we're actually gonna withdraw Article 19. Um, so we're gonna move forward though, towards either the special town meeting or next year's town meeting with a comprehensive list of things that we're gonna hopefully attempt to put in front of people to do to the town hall. We're done doing studies, I think. We now have a, an ability to move forward and make some renovations to the town hall. Hopefully we can get that to get some traction and do the right thing, restore the town hall, and, and have it, you know, useful purpose, you know, maintained. Things like um, electrical switchgear, sprinklers, uh, handicap accessible bathrooms, and better workspace, um, bringing it up to 2015 is really what we're hoping to attain uh, to make it a usable space. So, uh, if I understand correctly, it sounds like this is going to be more of a global and comprehensive process more directly involving the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Public Works and other perhaps interested boards to really fine tune do we need to buy new space or locate new space and whether or not we do that, what needs to be done at Town Hall and how can we implement it all on some thought out process. Exactly. And I can't tell you everybody's on the same page yet because these are late breaking meetings, if you will. But I think we've had some very good meetings where people are starting to understand the things that we could do, the possibilities that exist. And I've heard things that, you know, we don't want to do another Birchland where we just rip it down and build a new one. We have a town hall that's got sustainable life. It just needs some, some work. And uh, we're actually going to see what we can actually do in the form of small facelifts, you know, with some existing building funds we have this year just to kind of keep going. We did some a few years ago. Uh, I think some people would remember that the town hall was a little darker, a little dingier. 
Uh, we spruced it up a few years ago and then we kind of went on hold, you know, anticip in anticipation and not knowing exactly what was going to be done. I think now, you know, with that building not in the picture, we should really focus on what do we need to do to the town hall to make it a usable workable space and bring it up to code. So Very good. That's our hope. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this program, one of the zoning bylaw changes that you voters will be asked to act upon relates to marijuana, uh, specifically medical marijuana dispensaries and the regulation and use of those facilities throughout the town. There are four separate warrant articles that five. are five separate warrant articles that are interrelated regarding medical marijuana, articles 20 through 22 and 24 and 25. Mr. Kingston, who spoke earlier on behalf of the community preservation article, will now be speaking on behalf of the planning board to explain how those articles, what those articles say and what their impact will be. George. A little bit of background on this. Um, on November 6, 2012, the voters of the Commonwealth approved a law regulating the cultivation, distribution, possession, and use of marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, the law provides that it is effective on January 1, 2013. And our last annual town meeting, we passed a moratorium on med medical marijuana dispensaries in town that will expire on June 30th of this year. In order to regulate any dispensary that would come into town, and at this point, by the way, we have no indication of any particular interest in, in establishing a dispensary in town, but there could be one in the future. We need to modify our zoning bylaw so that we can regulate and control any potential um, medical marijuana facility that would come into town in the future. As a result, because this is a complex change to the zoning bylaw, we have five separate articles that need to be voted on because they're separate parts of the bylaw. The governing part of this is Article 20, which talks about the, uh, it replaces Section 6, which was the moratorium, and talks about the ability of people to put medical marijuana facilities into the town. The heart of this is that no medical marijuana facility shall be located within 300 feet of any existing residence or residential zoning district. No dispensary shall be within 1,000 feet of any of the following pre-existing structures or uses. Any school attended by children under the age of 18, any licensed child care facility, any drug or alcohol rehabilitation facility, any halfway house or similar facility, or any other registered marijuana dispensary. And no marijuana dispensary can be located within 500 feet of the following pre-existing structures or uses. Any church, any school, and any park, not to include the rail trail, bicycle path, any playground, any athletic playing field, or any youth center. In addition to this basic change in the bylaw, this is supported by four other articles. One is Article 21, which has the additional requirements for registered marijuana dispensaries because we're requiring, under the previous article, a special permit for each of these. And these additional requirements basically are in line with the regulations that the state has issued for such dispensaries and make it explicit as to what an ex a dispensary has to do in order to locate within the town. Article 22 echoes the state definitions related to medical marijuana. And these definitions are straight out of the state law and the state regulations. We have not modified them at all. The intention is to make sure that our bylaw corresponds to what the state has. Article 24 is an alteration to the schedule of uses table, which looks like this, it's in the bylaw, um, that basically adds this use to the schedule of uses table. And Article 25 is the dimensional requirements within the uh, industrial zone to, uh, for, for such, um, su such centers. So basically, it's a package that allows us to regulate these facilities within our town in compliance with state law. We've been told by the Attorney General in no uncertain terms 
that we cannot totally ban these facilities in any town in the Commonwealth. Uh, we can regulate them, but we cannot ban them. And so we're trying to regulate them so that if someone does come into town with one of these, it'll have a minimal impact and it will not be a attractive nuisance to underaged individuals in the town. And we're hoping that all five articles will pass as kind of a package so that we will be protecting ourselves from uh, someone who wants to come into town and locate one of these things in perhaps a retail area or an area that's near a school. Just to, uh, so I understand, um, the Attorney General has made clear that we, this town or other towns cannot prohibit them altogether. We did enact a one-year moratorium last year. So if these proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw were not enacted and the moratorium expires, then at least theoretically someone could come in and so long as they met other business criteria for any I guess business district or whatever other uses are permitted, such a dispensary could be established? That's correct. It could be considered either a retail facility or a medical facility, which are allowed in a lot broader areas of town and there are no restrictions on their being close to churches or schools. And we feel that that is not something that we want. We want to be able to restrict this to an area of town where it will have a minimum of impact and also not be an attractive nuisance. And just uh, so the voters know, changes to this town or any town's uh, zoning bylaw under state law requires a two-thirds vote, not a simple majority at town meeting. Thank Correct. you, George. Thank you. Articles 23 and 26, uh, sponsored by the Planning Board, propose an amendment to the zoning bylaw related to industrial garden districts. And here to explain what those articles are intended to accomplish is a member of the Planning Board, Tide Richards. Tide. Hey, thank you, Jim. Um, Article 23 really doesn't do anything different than what's already in the zoning, zoning ordinance for Industrial Garden Park. However, it does do a better job of describing and explaining what's already been agreed upon regarding zoning. And uh, the issue was and has been uh, when users wanted to open up a facility in the garden park, um, some of them have uh, retail st uh, stores that are associated with their operation of business, and, um, but that's not what the garden park is for. The garden park is for industrial purposes. So in order to allow users um, minimum uh, sales of retail, which corresponds with their business, we uh, uh, described and defined better what was allowed and what, was, what is not allowed. And what I'd like to do is just kind of read over the five bullet points that has to do, or which better defines uh, the retail sales for the garden park. For an example, retail sales in the garden park are only allowed at the counter. Uh, so uh, each industrial user uh, may have a counter for selling parts and things like that, um, but they can't just walk into a, a retail section of their building and browse Pull for things off the shelf, right. So it's got to be off uh, over the counter. Uh, no more than 10% of the floor area can be used for retail sales or 1,000 square feet, whichever is less. I mean, you, you cannot exceed 1,000 square feet, but you can go up and use 10% of your, your space for those retail sales, incidental retail sales. Um, if there are multiple businesses within the same building, then they each can have their own little retail section, once again under the same rules, 10% or 1,000 square feet, uh, no more than 1,000 square feet. Uh, regarding uh, a floor plan, if a uh, industrial user in the garden park wants to have some kind of a retail presence, uh, he, does have to, uh, um, he does have to provide a floor plan for review so that we all have a good understanding of what the size of that retail section is, what's being sold, so that we can approve it to make sure that it does comply with our zoning ordinance for the garden park. And uh, fourthly, uh, we would need a list of, to know what those items are being sold so that um, we can be sure that they are incidental sales and uh, someone is not uh, opening up a retail store within the garden park. So um, all these uh, five items have already been and have always been part of the zoning in the garden park, but uh, our article does a better job of defining and describing those so an applicant can read this, 
understand exactly, better understand exactly what he can and cannot do for retail sales in the garden park. So that's the purpose of Article 23. And then Article 26 is the table that implements those in terms of the, uh, the schedule of the permitted uses or permitted... Uh, exactly. It's the same table that um, has been present before, but it's just been uh, cleaned up um, for the garden park um, uh, clarification that we're doing. So it doesn't change anything, but it gives better clarification for the applicant to be able to um, you know, consider retail so sales within their uh, garden park district. Thank you. Article 27 will ask the voters to consider another proposed change to our zoning bylaw, this having to do with parking. And I believe it has to do with parking concerns with the potential for a casino in the city of Springfield. Here to educate me on that, and you as well, I hope, Sandro Mecha, a member of the planning board. Sandro. Thanks, Jim. Uh, basically, you pretty much touched how the spots on it. It's a very simple uh, um, article. Um, we're just basically um, defining a, um, putting a definition in say, saying that um, we would like only commuter, um, no commuter parking um, within business um, um, parking lots. Um, we're just looking to put whoever does business within that part, within, within, whoever can, people can park there, whoever does business there or is employed by the person that owns the parking lot. We're just trying to avoid commuter parking for, um, for casinos and things of that nature. So the way our zoning bylaw is currently drafted, um, unless a property owner had its own rules to enforce, individuals could come and park in the stop and shop lot or the big Y part and hop into a bus or hop into another car with other people and head off to other Correct. venues and, yep. and yep. thereby take up spots that right. business people in town would, would like to use. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, thank That's you. About it. Article 28 is a proposed uh, change to the zoning bylaw regarding uh, home offices and businesses. Uh, and again, it's my understanding it's going to be more of a clarification than anything substantive. But again, to straighten me out if I'm wrong, is Tide Richards from the Planning Board. Tide. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Article 28, as you said, is strictly clarification. It doesn't change the intent, the definition, or anything of the uh, private home office or studio. Um, but what it does do is it gives the applicant a better idea of what they can and cannot do uh, within a home-based business. For an example, uh, the first bullet point is to make a clarification that this applies for all businesses that require a business certificate. Um, the uh, second um, bullet point is there's been some confusion on the language. Um, in some cases, the word primary dwelling as opposed to um, principal dwelling has been used. So uh, in order to keep uniformity throughout the zoning ordinances, uh, we decided to remove or replace the word principal with primary so that it'd be consistent throughout the whole zoning ordinances. So that's the only change to uh, section B. Uh, section C just confirms the fact that the primary use or the business use, home office business use is a secondary use and that the dwelling is the primary use. Mm -hmm. Uh, Section D of Article 28 uh, says that the home office business use is limited to 20% of the dwelling. So not only does a dwelling have to be a residential use, no more than 20% of it can be used for home base operation. Um, uh, e uh, says that there's no uh, exterior uh, visibility or exposure to the street so that when people driving by the home that has a home base business in it, does not look at that as being a business, but looks at that as being a resident, mm -hmm. because that's what it is, it's mm -hmm. a resident. Mm -hmm. uh, Section F said that there be no ex exterior signs uh, to the residents, so that it just confirms the fact that it looks like a residence and it doesn't have a, you know, a sign out front uh, advertising someone's home-based business. Uh, Section G um, just confirms the fact that the home-based business will not be a nuisance, uh, to the neighborhood or to the community and that uh, all the operation of the business is confined within the dwelling so that it doesn't bother any of the neighbors or, or anyone um, uh, nearby. Um, section H uh, just confirms the fact that there's no off-premises sales. Uh, excuse me, on-premises sales. I mean, this is for um, a business to be conducted in the dwelling, but people are not 
to come to the dwelling to be purchasing items and, th and, and, and things like that, which of course would be a nuisance to neighbors at times. And, um, um, and, and then the, uh, the last item is that uh, just confirming the fact that the home-based business is not going to generate any additional pedestrian traffic or vehicle traffic. Um, the whole goal of this is not to change anything that's already been agreed upon, but just to clarify that um, to have a home-based business is a nice um, uh, convenience to have, but that convenience is not allowed to bleed into the neighborhood and cause a nuisance uh, to anyone in the surrounding area. And that is the purpose of Article 28, which is to clarify that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Articles 29 through 33 were each initiated by a citizen's petition. And as you may know, uh, under our bylaw, uh, any group at an annual, for an annual town meeting, uh, any group of 10 or more citizens can uh, file a petition to have a warrant article uh, added to the warrant and then acted upon at town meeting. Article 29 was petitioned by uh, Rick Murray, who was unable to be present tonight for the taping, but I do have a brief synopsis of what his uh, proposed uh, article uh, is intended to do. It says, this article is regarding the disruptive noise caused by nuisance fowl owned in uh, residential areas of East Longmeadow. It is not intended to request the removal of free-range chickens, which have become popular livestock. Roosters, however, create a noise nuisance to residents in surrounding neighborhoods. The noise created by this type of fowl happens at all hours of the day, beginning as early as 4 a.m. and continuing throughout daylight hours. The crowing of roosters creates the following impact, sleep deprivation affecting work and home life, inability to open windows at home to obtain, in an attempt to block the noise, unpleasant environment, especially when trying to enjoy one's own yard or entertain guests, potential degradation of property value could be difficult to encourage prospective buyers for homes when the cr crowing is loud and evident and potential of attracting fox and coyote into backyards. As part of this article, we have provided a petition and research documents to the Board of Selectmen which indicate that for most surrounding communities and towns, chickens are allowed but roosters are not due to a noise ordinance. So that will be Article 29. And Articles 30 through 33 are each uh, petitions for the town to accept and take uh, four roads within the town, uh, which are presently part of uh, subdivisions, as I understand it. 30, Article 30 is Fenway Lane. Article 31, Canterbury Circle. Article 32 is Black Dog Lane. And Article 33, uh, Dearborn Extension. So that's the roadmap to the action that's going to be in front of the town on Monday, May 19th at the high school for our annual town meeting. Uh, this program will be broadcast in several, uh, over several time periods uh, prior to the town meeting, as will the uh, budget hearing, which took place in late April, uh, where additional detail regarding the finances and the financial uh, poss uh, pro uh, process by which we arrived at some of the numbers uh, goes uh, is explained in great in great detail. Um, I hope and encourage you uh, to attend the town meeting. Uh, we run us, and by that I mean we, the citizens, run the town. But it's it's what we do at that town meeting has a very direct impact on the education our children receive, the taxes we pay, the businesses that are conducted, and how they are regulated. Every aspect of of life within the town. Uh, ultimately comes through the town meeting process and we're given the privilege as each individual is given the privilege to come and act as a legislator during that process. Um, and as I said last year, unlike uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, this town legislative body actually gets something done and does it in one night and does it efficiently. So I look forward to seeing you at the town meeting. Thank you for watching. <laughs>